Sorry about the delay, Lou, but we're good. It's okay. <laughs> okay, we're live. We're here. I'm Jay Fidel here on ThinkTech, and we're doing Energy in America here at the 3 p.m. block. We have Lou Pudirisi on from EPRINC, which is an energy think tank in Washington, D.C. And Lou, apparently in the last couple of weeks, got back. He got back from Japan, and he looks fine to me. Uh, no worse for the wear. Hi, Lou. Hi, I was actually in Cyprus last week. Ah, no kidding. <laughs> you get around, man. <laughs> yeah. Last week there was a major uh, conference on the resurgence of natural gas supplies from the eastern Mediterranean. So. Ah, interesting. There's a lot of gas in the world, it turns out. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, just a, a, a footnote, uh, is there were about maybe three, four years ago, there was a discovery off uh, Haifa that there was Medi in the Mediterranean that there was gas there, and the Israelis were trying to find a way to um, you know, mine that. So the Israelis were at the conference, and that project has gone to final investment. Ah, interesting. Wow. It's underway, yes. Things are changing Initial in gas. volumes will go into the Israeli power sector, and they, I believe, have concluded a deal with Jordan, of all things, to ship gas to Jordan. And in fact, while I was in Cyprus, Rex Tillerson called uh, the president of Cyprus and the, as you know, Cyprus is divided under this old Turkish, and Mr. Gringa, uh, the head of the unrecognized government of northern Cyprus, <laughs> uh, to encourage them to proceed with a final agreement. And, Oh, good. Reconciliation. <laughs> well, Greece needs a good agreement, doesn't it? Greece needs it's, a boost for its economy. And hope, hopefully, well, you know, Cyprus really is an independent country, a British protectorate with a heavy Greek influence. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Anyway, so uh, coming back to uh, the U.S. Um, and uh, still, uh, you know, observing the changes that are happening uh, through the uh, Trump administration. Um, you know, uh, we were going to talk about the EPA. The EPA uh, uh, is, is, is changing, and uh, Trump's appointment to the EPA um, is, has some specific feelings about, about protecting the environment and maybe changing the regulations that existed before in the Obama world uh, about the environment. And my question to you has been, you know, those changes uh, around the environment, uh, ostensibly, I guess, they would favor... Uh, Fossil fuel would favor coal, they would favor oil, they would favor, I guess, gas, too. And I wonder uh, what it looks like now that you're back in Washington. So, yeah, let, 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 let's, you know, I think the devil is in the detail in all these programs. And uh, I would say that, uh, I, I, you know, whether Scott, whether Pruitt, you know, the new head of EPA, really favors fossil fuels, I guess you could say, he has a more benign attitude towards it than, uh, than his predecessor. But um, if you look at the, his main approach, his, his fundamental approach is that I think he would argue that the agency became very preoccupied with climate and let go some of the fundamental uh, requirements of the agency, which was like clean air and clean water, and the traditional uh, requirements that the agency is supposed to pursue. So I think that would be, I, I can't speak for Mr. Pruitt, but that's what I believe he would say, and that uh, the agency is responsible for a lot of overreach undertaking tasks for which the Congress never gave them authority to do so. Mm -hmm. And there are three immediate areas, I think, in which the so-called overreach of the agency is being addressed. I mean, we can put this aside from the budget call. The first one is the midterm review or the midterm evaluation for the automobile standards. It's a very complicated issue, but under the analysis done by the National Academy of Sciences, which participated heavily the understanding was with that all the stakeholders, the environmentalists, the auto industry, would have until the spring of 2018 to evaluate 
the midterm review and to determine whether the standards should stay where they are or go to the higher level that were required, uh, that were proposed in, under the rulemaking. So, and President Obama did not wait for the review for this was supposed to take place through 2017. He just issued the reg as a midnight rule in uh, before he left office in December. So mm -hmm. this is an area of which not just, I, I would say the environmentalists probably liked it, but the auto industry was very disappointed and lots of other folks, lots of other stakeholders who had a, who wanted to look at this standard more carefully. And keep in mind that because we are entering and continue to be in an era of lower gasoline prices, the EPA standard pushes the industry to build a fleet of cars that the consumers don't want to buy. And that creates some potential for dislocations in the auto industry. And if you think about President Trump, the manufacturing folks in the Midwest, these are very strong supporters of it. So mm -hmm. I believe that that standard may not be changed, but I do think the review will be pulled back and the ex ante condition in which we would have a whole year to look at it will be restored. Mm -hmm. Well, so you know, where does it go on um, you know the notion of climate change? Uh, where does it go on you know keeping carbon out of the air? Uh, well, let, let's talk about that. You know, uh, people get you know. I, I realize that a lot of people have their hair on fire over this climate stuff, <laughs> and uh, they're really nervous. People forget, you know, the United States never signed the Kyoto Protocol, right. yet we far exceeded the implied requirements we would have had under it. We far exceeded it, largely because of the resurgence of natural gas. So I, I do think we are going to a, an era here on, I mean, this question on climate, will we pull out of the Paris Accord? Does it matter whether we pull out of the Paris Accord is a more interesting question. And that leads me to the second big issue, which is the so-called Clean Power Plan. Now, it's very important that under the Clean Power Plan, the U.S., through another regulatory measures, would have required all the regional utilities to comply with a certain standard of lower CO2 emissions. Yeah, this was, this was in play in Hawaii, for sure. Yes, but... No one ever talks about, even if you run the IPCC models, the UN models, no one ever discusses the fact that even a fully implemented clean power plan would have no effect on world climate. Okay. If you take the US piece and stick it into the model, you cannot measure the difference. Even if you, even if you accept the model, which many people do not, if you run it, you can't tell the difference. So that whole program was based entirely on the benefits of leadership. Well, but, but going back, I mean, uh, if you impose uh, higher standards on the emissions from a power plant, um, then there should be a global difference, don't you think? I mean, I'm not saying one power plant's going to change it or even no, one no, state. No, I, I agree with you. you, you we, you know, in theory, you're right, but the point is the U.S. has made such remarkable improvement through the marketplace, through the use of additional supplies and natural gas, that the incremental benefit from the clean power plan, as measured in the climate models, mm -hmm. was close to zero. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it wasn't worth doing or not, or, or worth doing. It, it just means that's what the data show. Mm -hmm. And the basic position, much like the pr President Obama's decision to kill Keystone and these other projects were based on, well, the U.S. had to put on a hair shirt to show the rest of the world <laughs> that we're prepared to do these things. And if we're prepared to do these things, then you should go ahead and do them yourself. Okay. But this was, this, whether this is an effective strategy suggests to me uh, is a matter of some, you know, facts 
for example, the Indian government has announced that they are not that impressed with our leadership and they are going to proceed and build a great many coal-fired power plants. So it uh, gets back to an old argument we have, where should you put your money? Should you put it into adaption or should you put it into uh, climate mitigation? Mm -hmm. ah, well, that's interesting. Because, I mean, uh, the leadership aspect, I mean, um, yeah. if, if he but came out, if Obama came shouldn't. out and, 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 and you know, made that impression on, around the world, uh, and even if not everybody followed it, even if some people followed it, um, that, you know, that would have a positive effect. But it strikes me now that that, that leadership doesn't, doesn't exist, uh, that nobody is going to say, well, we're going to clean up our act because the United States has gone the extra mile. Uh, although I would say, I mean, you must know more about this, but some countries are cleaning up their act anyway. Uh, they don't Some necessarily follow our leadership. With, first, uh, I would like to point out, carbon dioxide is an odorless and colorless uh, gas. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily clean or dirty. It's, uh, it, you, know, you could argue that, uh, yes, if you burn coal, you get particulate matter. And it would be a nice thing if the Chinese would turn on their scrubbers and take the particulates out of the atmosphere, which apparently they don't like to do because it uses a lot of energy. But uh, you're correct in that sense, that some countries are proceeding with abatement strategies to reduce CO2. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. though, and we, by the way, we will continue. We've had the most massive reduction in CO2 in the last 20 years, probably outpacing any other country. But going back to the point you made earlier, and I think it's really worth discussing at least for a minute, um, that it's not so much uh, whether the United States will withdraw from the Paris Accord. I mean, Trump has said he wants to do that. But whether it will mean anything if we withdraw from the Paris Accord, uh, suggesting maybe that it won't mean anything. Will it mean anything, Lou? What do you think? No, I, I don't think, I think that there is, uh, we talked about this, I think there is this sense of many supporters of Trump that, uh, you know, a combination of bureaucrats, academics with too much power, the International Association of Name Droppers, the Davos attending elites have all conspired to take away, you know, to prevent us from having anything bad happening and in doing so have prevented all the upsides and that this, this kind of uh, atmosphere or con needs to be disrupted. I think this is what Bannon and these folks want to do. And so we are going to see a lot of this for a while. Mm -hmm. One other thing we talked about just before the show uh, was uh, permitting reform. Uh, yes. That, uh, there's changes in the EPA about permitting reform. And let's touch that brief briefly before our break. So if you think about permitting, uh, let's say you want to build an LNG export facility in Oregon, for example. Um, you have to get permits from the EPA, the Corps of Engineers, the Department of Energy, the Bureau of Land Management, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and various other state and local agencies. And I know for a fact that uh, in a meeting with President Trump, uh, he met with a lot of senior executives where they had this high, you know, this high-minded view about what we need to do to grow the economy. But the folks from uh, one of the major LNG exporting facilities said, look, we have a real project. And let us explain to you how hard it is. For example, we want to put a pipeline through Bureau of Land Management, you know, public land in western Oregon. But we have, when we put that pipeline through, we need to, you know, cut some trees down. And, but we're happy to mitigate that by bringing in other trees somewhere else. But, oh, wait a minute. The Interior Department took all that land that could have been used to mitigate it and already put it in reserve. So we can't find any reserve to do this. So at each step of the way, and I, I'm not saying these are good or bad things. I'm just saying that 
if you want to grow the economy, if it's important for you to get jobs and to have wealth creation, you actually have to give people permission to break ground occasionally. <laughs> and if you don't give them a permission to do that, they and I don't do care it. whether you're talking about a hotel in Maui or a pipeline in the U.S., <laughs> You're not going to get economic <laughs> growth. You may choose to do that. That you may think that's a good thing. That's fine. But you need to confront that directly. Okay, and we need to take a break. But <laughs> I really enjoy your comments. Let's take a short break. We will come back and talk about oil in this in this country and the production of oil, how it's going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a good. <laughs> Aloha. I'm Bill Sharp, your host of Asia Review. Watch us every week, every Monday afternoon, for exciting, up-to-date information and analysis about contemporary affairs in Asia. Bye. Aloha. I'm Richard Emery. I'm with co-host Jane Sugimura of Condo Insider, Hawaii's weekly show about association living. The uh, purpose of these videos is to educate board members and condo residents about issues uh, relating uh, to association living. Uh, we hope they're helpful and uh, that they uh, assist in resolving uh, problems that uh, affect the relationship uh, between boards and their residents. Each week, Thursday at 3 p.m., we bring you exciting guests, industry experts, who for free will share their advice about how to make your association a better place to live and answer a lot of very interesting questions. Aloha, we hope you'll tune in. Yeah, we're obvious. back, we're live, we're here with Lou Pugliarisi having a, um, what do you call it, hair down discussion <laughs> about energy in America. And uh, we talked about uh, some of the things that have uh, flowed out of, if you will, uh, the changes in the EPA. And, um, and now we're gonna talk about oil. We're going to talk about the, um, you know, the oil production in the United States and I guess in the world. How is it doing and how is it affecting things, Lou? Yes. So as you know, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries were quite distressed when the price of oil dropped down to $30 a barrel. And led by the Saudis and some other major producers and even getting cooperation from the Russians, they've been able to cobble an agreement together to con curtail output, uh, but somewhere around uh, 500 to 700, 800,000 barrels a day. It just depends how you do the number. And the price of oil has begun to settle around 50 to 55 dollars a barrel. But the interesting thing about this is, as the price of oil has moved to around 55 dollars a barrel, U.S. production has begun to recover mm -hmm. and to recover at a very fast rate. Much of this has to do with the Permian Basin, which has what's called so-called stacked plays. That is, you can produce from various zones, you know, below the earth using uh, hydraulic fraction, fraction, hydraulic fracturing and directional drilling. And the productivity of the drilling rigs and the productivity of all the integrated technology has continued to expand at such a fast clip that it now appears that the Permian Basin alone could expand production over the next seven to ten years by 10 million barrels a day at existing prices. Where is the Permian Basin? It's in West Texas, largely. Mm. And it's all on private land, which makes the permitting issue we talked about earlier much easier to deal with. So if you have an oil, so if you have a, I mean, the, this joke is, is that uh, you, if you think about oil and gas development historically, you usually search for a very large uh, discovery somewhere, a trap somewhere maybe deep offshore of the Arctic, this would take you eight to ten years to get going. You'd have a lot of technical risk and a lot of financial risk. But for shale oil and gas, for unconventional reserves, you can, as they say, pass the hat at the River Oaks Club in Houston, mm -hmm. get enough money to drill a hole, <laughs> and in 30 to 60 days you have revenue. Pretty good. So it's a very fast responding uh, technology. And since it's on private land, 
You don't have to write a national environmental policy assessment. You don't have to visit a half dozen bureaucrats in Washington and beg for your permit. You just uh, contact the Texas Land Commission and the Texas Railroad Commission, which are generally very favorable to oil and gas development, and uh, you're on your way. So the fundamental structure of the of the technology, the nature of how it's produced, because you're producing from source rock, not from uh, traditional traps, and it's more like a manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. All of this is starting to play out to fundamentally change the way we think about the world oil market. So, uh, well, it's the American oil market that's interesting that we, ha yes, we have this right. uh, supply of oil uh, and it actually affects pricing. Uh, so, but, but do you think that uh, prices will go up or down at the pump now that we have this new level of production? Well, the Permian may be more productive than other parts of the U.S. And I know that the the head of OPEC, who was at Houston this week at the giant conference they have down there, uh, was trying to talk to the shale producers and say, look, you know, be careful you don't overdo it. You might undermine the price. But the thing is, we have 8,000 shale producers in the U.S. You can't really negotiate with them in any meaningful way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so the question is, will the other big basins in the U.S., in North Dakota, New Mexico, Wyoming, Colorado, they are not quite as productive as the Texas basins. So they may, they may decline or not do as well at these lower prices, but the introduction of these new pipelines, the Dakota Access Pipeline, I'm sure you've read about that, which looks like it might be in operation in the middle of this month. Mm -hmm. The chance to go forward with the Keystone XL Pipeline is making the transportation of crude oil through the North American continent much more efficient. So the prospects for these other basins is looking quite good. So I can easily give you a model of the world in which it says, it doesn't matter if OPEC cuts back. Uh, their cutbacks in production, yeah, they may keep the price from going to 30, but they're not going to be able to get it much higher than 55. Yeah. Well, the, all this soil development in the U.S. Uh, actually um, helps in terms of our need to buy, uh, with, you know, the uh, oil from the Middle East. No, we we have a yes, need for less. Fact, Right now, right now, uh, one of the things that we're concerned about is that the, the let's say, the kerfuffle over manufacturing trade with Mexico and Canada to some extent, but mostly Mexico, not disrupt the energy trade, which is extremely productive and helpful to the U.S. In fact, if you took the U.S., Canada, and uh, Mexico as a single country. Mm -hmm. Those three countries together are consuming 22 million barrels a day. But their net imports are only 4 million barrels a day. And those three countries in four or five years will be net exporters combined. Well, that'll change things uh, you know, around the world. It's it? already changing things rather dramatically. And, and it will, uh, you know, we, we've had a kind of a monopoly in some ways, or at least a large uh, economic force in the market from the Middle East. Uh, this, will, uh, this will change that, no? This, this has deterred it substantially. And here's the other interesting thing for all the climate buffs that are out there. The surge in U.S. gas production is moving to Mexico and exports to Mexico on a massive scale. And the Mexicans are backing out their heavy fuel oil uh, power generation facilities and replacing them with natural gas. Mm -hmm. Well, how does the natural gas, you know, the, the boom, if you will, in natural gas affect the, this increase in oil production? I mean, it's, it's directly competitive in some areas of, of energy, isn't it? Well, oddly enough, uh, if you produce uh, unconventional oil, you usually need gas to move that oil to the surface. So when you produce the oil, you get some gas. Mm -hmm. Now for the U.S., the bulk, the most productive resources are the gas fields in the Marcellus Basin, Basin in Pennsylvania. But gas and oil really don't compete with each other in the continental United States. Mm -hmm. uh, very little power gen is done by oil in the U.S. Mexico was an exemption. Hawaii is also an exception. 
Uh, most of the you know most of the world is moving away from uh, power gen through uh, with oil, mm -hmm. and we've also had uh, announcements of three major petrochemical facilities in the U.S. Quite remarkable. Well, let me let me uh, zoom back for a minute to the climate change issue because uh, yeah. you know these changes at the EPA we talked about in the first part of the show and the Im increased production in oil in the second part. And, and, and the clear fact that the Trump administration, um, you know, is, is looking to make it easier uh, for these producers, looking to make it easier for these carbon fuels. Um, now, you know, we, we saw a lot of information and a lot of discussion at Paris and otherwise um, about, you know, what, what appears to be um, a, a climate uh, crisis. Uh, and that if humanity doesn't do something in the, in the near term, um, we are, we are, we're going to lose the planet. Uh, and, and, you know, this may be all and well from an economic point of view and from a national, you know, uh, national economy point of view, national, uh, nationalistic point of view. Um, it, it doesn't help much, does it, on the climate change issue? I mean, so what, should, I I be, should I be less worried now about climate change? Yeah, I actually, I think I would, I would suggest that there's, there is a legitimate uncertainty over the scale and scope and magnitude of the climate consequences. In fact, there was a very interesting hearing on the House Science Committee last week. I'm happy to send you the link for that or for your read. And it would be interesting to listen to it because there were, there were like uh, researchers on both sides of this issue. And I would think that within the within the Trump administration, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily call them deniers, but I would say that their view is that the uh, consequences of CO2, increases in CO2, uh, are, at least among some serious researchers, less concerned than others. Okay. And I don't know what it means to lose the you know, to lose the planet, you know. I think there's a legitimate debate here. What is the most important issues in the world? You know, you have large poverty, dysentery, you have war, conflict in the Middle East. Is really climate the most important thing we face? Well, I, uh, well, some people feel that way. I mean, look at some the... Some people uh, do feel that way. Look I at agree. the glaciers. Look at the ice caps. There's something profound happening to this planet on a larger scale. It's our platform, whatever we do. And if we lose the platform, we are no more. Well, the Earth has gone through major, you know, they used to call it Greenland for a reason. I mean, I just think <laughs> that... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's something I think we should pay attention to. I think we should get on the gradient. I actually don't think it's as serious a problem as lots of other ones we face. But that's just a you know personal view okay, on my well, part. I really <laughs> enjoy these discussions, and we will follow it. We'll follow all of this. There's so many <laughs> things happening in energy in every way, in, in every country, in every, in every system. And I really enjoy talking to you about it. Two weeks from hence, we'll do it again, right? Okay, absolutely.